But it's good to see you guys this morning. Um, <clears throat> Brother Bryant uh, put me a little order of service together so I keep my things straight a little better here. But uh, So uh, first thing I'm supposed to do is welcome you. So uh, welcome. We're just thrilled that you could be here today. If you're not a regular worshiper with us, we are indeed grateful that you are here. Um, and, uh, you know, it just uh, always seems like... Uh, it rains on Sunday sometimes, so, but I'm grateful that you guys made it here today. Um, and we always begin our service with prayer, of course. So let's uh, go to the Lord, and after that, we're going to greet our guests. Father, I just thank you so very much for this day. Lord, thank you for the rain. Thank you for all the things you do for us. I thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege. It was mine just to this last hour to uh, teach the youth. God, what a, what, what a wonderful group of young people. God, I thank you that they received uh, from you. Lord, thank you for the beautiful picture of David coming back to God and that all of us can be brought back. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace. I pray God do a work here today in this service that brings glory to you and honor to you alone. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. amen. Well, we want to greet our guests, and if you're not a regular worshiper with us, thank you, thank you, thank you, as Gomer Powell used to say. Um, uh, we really appreciate you being with us. Just Here's how we're going to greet our guests. As you just remain seated, our church family will stand, we'll greet you. Um, someone will probably hand you a gift here from our church. And we just want to say thank you. That way we kind of know who's who. And when we start singing, uh, well, after that, Gene's going to give the announcements. And then uh, we'll take our, our offering. We'll, then we'll get right into things. But, uh, uh, but we want you to stand with us when we're doing everything. I think they just, no, I thought my microphone came back on. So uh, I guess not. So, uh, well, well, God bless you. We are grateful that you are here today. So church family, would you now please stand and all those our guests remain seated. We just want to say thanks for coming. God bless you. We do welcome you on this cold, rainy day to Chisholm Creek Baptist Church. Uh, if you have a special prayer request, we would be honored to pray for your request. There's prayer request cards on the prayer stand, which is by the name badges out there, a little white stand, there's there's cards there. You can fill it out and put it in there. And our prayer room ministry would be honored to pray for your request. Right now, we are going to have another grief share video. Um, so, um, and, and Brother Dave, would you raise your hand, Brother Dave, if you're interested in this uh, ministry, there's just this started me for a couple of weeks, so they'd love to have you part of that. Announcing while oh, there we go. Is a support group ministry that helps people heal from the pain of grief. The grief share video seminars, workbook exercises, and small group discussions give participants encouragement, useful advice, and hope. The videos, they're very <laughs> believable. It just seemed like regular people speaking from the heart. They helped me focus my thoughts. Having many different people on the videos from week to week makes a huge difference. The video strengthened me. The way I grew up, people had a funeral, they went to somebody's house, ate a lot of food, and you never talked about it after that. Uh, and to be able to sit in a small group and hear people actually express what I was thinking and feeling was quite refreshing. I needed to be in a situation where I could talk freely about my feelings and my grief and not feel like that I was causing other people to be uncomfortable. My workbook helped me to unravel the feelings that were I was going through. I found that the workbook was so helpful in that while the video I was watching it, I could make notes. And it helps me go back and, and remember how God can help me. If you know people in your church or community who are grieving the death of a loved one, tell them about Grief Share or visit a Grief Share group yourself to heal from the pain of your grief. And remember, no matter how long ago you lost your loved one, you are always welcome at Grief Share. 
There was such a void until I got into Grief Share. Grief Share has been a big help and encouragement to me. Grief Share brought me out of my sadness. Begin your journey from mourning to joy at Grief Share. Once again, they meet tomorrow night at 6.30, and I know that uh, Brother Dave would love to have you come. Uh, our men are not praying on Tuesdays. They're praying on Monday mornings now at 9 o'clock. Uh, so if you'd like to come and pray, it's Monday mornings now at 9 o'clock. Wednesday evening, Dan is teaching through the book of Revelation, and this Wednesday night's Marriage of the Lamb is Revelation 19, our children's wanna meets. And our youth group meets that evening, too. Uh, we will not have adult choir practice this Wednesday night. Uh, and um, our Grace Rescue Mission items, so there's a big container in the front. If you'd like to give to that ministry, our church has been asked to bring items for Grace Rescue Mission this month. And there's items are listed in the bulletin. Uh, we just want to tell you that Dan does two phone tree messages each week, usually on a Wednesday and a Saturday for Sunday. And if you don't re do not receive the messages, please let us know. We would love to have you part of that. And somebody asked if you have to be a member. No, you don't have to be a member to receive the phone tree messages. Just uh, let us know and we will put you on that list. Church meal on March the 3rd. We are having a big uh, church chili and soup meal on that Sunday. We'd love to have you come and stay with us after church on that Sunday. And now we're going to take up the offering. Well, this morning, we, uh, as we take the offering, I want to mention, last week we were, um, uh, it was first of the month, and, and the, the Lord just blessed. Well, thank you for your faithfulness last week. And today, just do what God tells you to do. Here's how we take the offering. Put in as God has blessed you. Take if you have a need, if you need food, clothes, shelter, whatever, uh, something like that, we like to help you. So either put in, take out, and that'll be just right. So, Father, thank you so much for this offering. Thank you for those that give. We give not because we have to, we get to. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of uh, being a part of what you're doing. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and start our time of praise and worship.
forgot to mention that um, we started last week, at least we introduced it to you, uh, that we have a new, uh, uh, it's called a church app uh, that you can uh, give on, etc. We had these little cards. We still have them out in the foyer. Also, there is a big uh, banner, it's not a banner, it's, um, it's on a table, it's a pretty good size like that. It's got the, this QR code on there, you can download that, but if you're watching on YouTube at home, uh, across wherever you may be, well, Lord willing, if you'll get this app, um, uh, we will uh, start next week trying to get uh, our notes on that app so you'll actually have the notes before you, um, uh, b before we, in fact, you can go and see, it's up on the screen now, I think. I don't know if the QR code is up there or not. Uh, oh, it is. There it is. <laughs> okay. But um, so if you can, if you're uh, watching this at home, you can uh, do that. But not only can you give in all different ways, you can give to the uh, work here at the church and our ministries here. But um, well, I want you to have these notes uh, before you hear me preach. You can have these notes. Now, uh, let me quickly mention the, the deacons are passing out a paper that I did on grief. So let's get right into our text today. Um, this is a paper uh, I spent quite a bit of time, uh, even though it's only three pages, front and back of one page and the back page of another. I don't guess, uh, hey, uh, men, I don't have a copy of my own paper. If you wouldn't mind, let me have one, please. And uh, thank you. No, they're, they're bringing. I don't want to take yours. No, I got an extra one. You got an extra one. Okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm in good shape. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. I appreciate that. But um, we're, I'm preaching on grief today because that's what's in the text. And uh, I put all this stuff on the front because sometimes people won't read something unless they think you know what you're doing. And so I want people, I want this to be 
duplicate this all you like, give it away to friends, family, others. It is the biblical answers to, to grief. When, and there's all types of grief that people go through. I had a lady come into my office years ago. In fact, I, I, I teasingly tell the staff, I think we buy more Kleenex than any other uh, church in town because, um, but grief finds its way into my office every week. And so I deal with it all the time. And I'm honored to do that because people are hurting. Uh, but this um, is an answer. It's got the world's way of dealing with grief. And there's some truth in that. And I'm, I mentioned that. This uh, Swiss uh, lady, I read her book years and years ago. And uh, she had this thing on grief. But I've put a biblical concept of grief as well as with uh, verses to go by and how to use those verses by putting your name in the first person of all those pronouns. I underlined as many of them. Now, folks, Jeannie did not pre-read this. It's full of hanging participles, misspelled words, and weird stuff, all right? So, it's simply because I, it, I, I'm not smart enough to, to, to do that. But, uh, but it was the secretaries had already finished when I decided to do this. But uh, I want this to be something that can be used constantly and put quite a bit of work into it to help you. Today we're going to Genesis chapter 35. We're moving right through our great text here. Of the, and next week it's predominantly a genealogy that I've already done for you at Christmas time. So I'm only going to tip my hat at that very quickly then move right straight on next week to um, 37. Now, there are a few things in here we do need to see, and I want to emphasize those to you in chapter 36. So 36 will come and go fairly quickly. Just I'll take about four or five minutes with you on that, deal with it. But I want to get on to chapter 37 to next week, which is the story of Joseph, because Joseph will, will follow him all the way to the finished of this book. And um, it is, um, uh, and, and that's really, but since I've already spent quite a bit of time at Christmas, you know, two weeks going over genealogy, it's the same genealogy, I'll, I will uh, capitalize that for you, give it to you next week, and then we'll go quickly on to chapter 37 and, and, and start in on the life of Joseph, which means the one who adds. That's a wonderful name of a man. So, um, uh, just a quick review, last week we were looking at um, the, what happened there at Shechem with uh, Levi and Simeon and Dinah uh, is horribly uh, raped and all that mess. And, and we don't see God's name one time, not once, in all of chapter 34. And, uh, <clears throat> and so it was a tough, tough situation. Today... We're going to see God's name all over that. We're going to see it 22 times in this one chapter. 11 times directly and another 11 times within words like Bethel and El Shaddai, etc. So we will um, look at that. So put them all together. You've got 22 times do we see God's name. It's a revival. It's a revival. I almost titled this The Revival of Grief, but I thought, well, it doesn't, that doesn't make a bit of sense, does it? But, so I've entitled today's message Good Grief because God can take this, and we do see a revival here. We see God all over this uh, chapter, and we see if you've gone through hurt, and grief is not just someone dies. There's other ways of grief, and you're going to see that today with Reuben. That's the oldest son of... Um, uh, of Jacob of Israel and uh, of course you know he invented a sandwich and we're grateful for that so um, but um, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> I just threw that in but, uh, but what exactly is grief well uh, we, we, <laughs> when you think of death usually that's the first thing is when someone dies and you grieve but grief is an emotional reaction we feel when we have suffered a loss of any kind, all kinds of loss. Any major shock uh, in your life can produce grief. I know people who retire and they go into a, a time of grief. Um, a, a pet can die that you've had for a long time and you can grieve. 
I actually had a lady come in my office once, and she was weeping in her heart, and bless her heart, uh, she's watching, please forgive me, I'm not going to mention your name, but I'm not making fun of you either, uh, but, um, but still, she was grieving, and um, <laughs> uh, she had lost a plant, and um, I guess that plant meant a lot to her, uh, that's all I can say, <laughs> and, and she said, haven't you ever lost a plant? I said, many. <laughs> I said, they don't live long enough around our house for us to grieve. I'm sorry. So they're, they're here today and gone tomorrow. But, uh, but needless to say, any type of loss can be a grief to you. And this is God's way of dealing with it. So um, uh, I'm just so thrilled that, uh, that God gives us and, and this is actually a revival. So, so the first thing I want you to see, the revival in the midst of grief, these first seven verses. Let me read them to you as we uh, open up God's word. Then God said to Jacob, which is the same as Israel, Arise, go up to Bethel, house of God, and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods or the idols that are among you. Purify yourself and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make a uh, altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way in which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their foreign gods, all their idols that were in their hands and the earrings that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was at Shechem. And they journeyed. God, they're leaving now. They're going back to finally doing what God told them to do in chapter 31, go back to Bethel. So they journeyed in terror, and terror of God was upon them of the cities as they, were, <clears throat> as they were all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz. Now, he, he's always renaming things. Uh, uh, that, that's the same as Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Now, that's not Spanish. That's, that's Greek. I mean, that's Hebrew, excuse me. But that means God. Anytime you see El, it's just a short form of Elohim is what that means. Um, because there came, uh, there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now, Deborah, here's our first death. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse. That's Jacob and Esau's mother. Remember, Rebecca, Isaac's wife. Rebecca's nurse died, and she was buried uh, below Bethel under the Terebeth tree. So the name of that place was Elon Bakuth. The, which means in Hebrew, the oak of weeping or the oak of grief. Wow. Well, as I said, we see the first death here, but also we're seeing a revival. We do see revival. Uh, you know, revival begins uh, inside a person's heart. God is doing something deep. Jacob's been pretty passive with his kids. He hasn't been very involved with them. We saw that last week with, the, with Dinah, with Levi and Simeon killing all those men in Shechem. And, but, uh, but Jacob now, um, you know, this personal revival that's inside his heart begins to spread to his children. He says, let's get rid of these idols. Whoa. First thing on revival Get rid of your idols. And friend, anything can be an idol. He said, what, what, what can be an idol? Well, all right, let's pretend my hand's God, all right? And uh, here, here I am, okay? Here's God. Anything that comes between me and God, I don't care, you name it, is an idol. It could be a, a 67... Uh, uh, Corvette Stingray 427 Turbo. I mean, uh, uh, anything comes between you and God, that is your God. And that's, what we'll, that's why you'll go to hell, because you've got something between you and God. When, uh, now, can Christians have idols? Yes, and they're not going to hell. I would say that. 
but God will judge you for that. But God said, get these idols. Remember, Rebe- it was Rachel who took Laban's gods, and, and they, when they left uh, uh, Padan Haram, and uh, here they are, they're, they're running off with the gods. And Laban chases them almost all the way to the edge of that country because he wanted his gods back. May I say to you, if somebody can steal your gods, they're not much of a god. Amen? <laughs> I would uh, I'd check that god and say, hey, you know, I don't think I need that god anymore. Friend, there is but one god. And thou shalt have no other gods before me. When I teach, and I do this about every five years, and it's coming up, I'm going to go all the way through the Ten Commandments with our kids. Everyone, a commandment a week. You know why? Because that's vitally important. Number one on the list, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you don't get that one down, you don't need to read the rest. Because it won't work. You've got to get that one down. No other gods before me. And so, it's revival. Revival. It's revival coming to his heart. It's revival. Get rid of all this. His kids pick up on it. They're getting rid of their junk and putting it out. And they're moving. They're going to go back to do what God told them to do almost 20 years ago. Go back to Bethel. Or 10 years ago, excuse me. And so because they've been where they were for 10 years. But now they're going back. To, they were in 20 up in the, uh, Padan Haram. But now they're going back from Shechem after 10 years there. And this lady dies. Her name is Deborah. She was Jacob's nanny when he was little. Annie Saul's, obviously, Rebecca's nurse. This lady taught him many things. Obviously, Rebecca is dead. And now, Deborah, uh, he invites Deborah to come and live with him. And now she is an elderly lady, but one that means so much to Jacob, but she dies. And now he buries her, and he's weeping, and he names the place that under this oak tree where he buries her, the oak of weeping or grief. But revival is happening. I like what Charles Finney, the great evangelist, said uh, about you know, over 150, 175 years ago. Revival, a new beginning of obedience to God. That's what revival is. It's a new beginning of obedience to God. El Bethel, God uh, of the house of God. That's really what the word means, El Bethel. You've got two L's there. El, God, Beth, which is the word house, and L again. So it's the God of the house of God. God always seeks to bring us to the highest level. And many times he will use grief to do that. Folks, if you have never grieved before, hang on, it's coming. This life is full of grief. And I wanna, we're going to deal with it head on. It's always darkest before the dawn. Do you know there's no darkness in heaven? (laughs) I'll talk about that at the end. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But there is no darkness. Jesus is the light of heaven. But when it seems dark, rejoice and pray for revival. That's what we should do. That's what Jacob is doing. Psalm 85, verse 6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? You know, God is the only one who can initiate true revival and heal grief at the same time. He can bring revival and and deal with your grief at the same time. Put away your idols, number one on the list, verses two through five. Get rid. And after you do that, change your garments. What? I mean... (laughs) change your clothes you don't understand these are Bedouin people in tents they don't have lots of different changes of clothes they don't have the hygiene that we use today in restroom facilities and all that type of thing that's all fairly modern uh, it's quite different and so um, they couldn't clean their body their clothes so he's saying it, take your clothes and wash them Wash your body. Put 
fresh, clean clothes on because it's a new day. We're going to start again. Amen. So that's what that's all about. And you see it throughout the Bible. I just thought I may explain it to you a little bit more. And so then he said, let us arise and go to Bethel. Oh, we're getting out of this dark place of Shechem where we, all these de death is. And we're, we're moving on. And so praise the Lord. Um, and they journeyed. And the terror of God, verse 5, was upon the cities that all around them. And they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So we see here, uh, they get rid of these idols. I idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in your life. Quickly, let me go to the second point. Jacob's grief. We see he renews the role as a parent. Thank God for that. Look at here. First time Jacob is actively involved with his children, but now he's, he's this is the very first time. As I said, he's been a passive parent. He just let Deborah go on out there with these uh, weirdos, and look what happened last week. Uh, he's admonishing his children. It's the first time that we have any record that he admonishes his children. Uh, now think about this, folks. Uh, the Bible says we're to train our children. We're to admonish. So where's that in the Bible? Well, thanks for asking. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. As you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath or grief. But bring them up in the training and the admonition. There's your word. Ad admonish them in the Lord. Jacob saw his commitment and he saw, hey, I need to get to work. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, there's a difference between training and teaching. You know, training involves teaching. There's no question. Some of you know that years ago, I, I worked for, I got all the way up where I was just about ready to start uh, soloing. But uh, our church, we were trying to relocate our building and I was asking everybody to sacrifice. The Lord laid on my heart you know, temporarily to stop taking flying lessons and to, uh, uh, to do that. So I gave that up and uh, one of these days, who knows, um, uh, go back doing that. <clears throat> I'm really grateful. I've had many men in our church over the years, not this church, other churches, have airplanes that let me fly them with them in it, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's legal or not, but uh, at least they let me do it. So, um, uh, but, I, but I enjoy uh, doing that still. Uh, you can, if, let's suppose, I, I, you know, some pilot here would teach everybody here on the screen, everything, how to fly an airplane. And then as you leave, we give you a license to fly an airplane. And there's planes out there. Just go ahead and take off. You've been taught. Take off. See you later, alligator. Because he ain't coming back. <laughs> See, there's a huge difference between teaching and training. Training, somebody's got to sit there right with you and make sure you're doing it the right way. Because your life's at stake in other people's lives too, but below you. You, you, you see what I'm getting at there? The, you, you do more than just teach your children. You train them. You train them just like you're training. It's, it's very important to train up a child in the way that they should go. Uh, that word there in Proverbs 22 is the Hebrew word shanak. Shanak. It means to literally stimulate taste is what the word means. The, a mother would take the, her finger with a little baby and stick it in date honey. And then they would rub it on the little baby's lips and it would make the baby suck. And it, it would in, instigate that there. Also, the word Chinook, I brought this here up to help you understand it. It means to find the bend. <laughs> I probably, I don't, know, I don't want to break this, but, um, but you know, just like a limb, I was going to go out and get a tree and cut a limb off, but I thought oh, this would be easier. But, and, but, but, you know, limbs have curves in them, don't they? And also it means to find the curve in your child's nature. 
and to train a child the way that God has bent them. Amen? Uh, because one kid will be quite different than another kid. Have you ever noticed that? They're not all the same. Quite different, aren't they? <laughs> so find the bend and take a little sweetness and put it on their lip to train them, to teach them, and bring them. But find the curve that God placed in them and train them according to that curve. I guarantee you, I have two kids. Boy, they are as different as can be, but I had to find that curve and work with them. You, you, you see what I'm getting at? That's Chinook. That's what it means to, to train up a child in the way they should go. And so a parent should walk in the way himself, train a child in the way he should go. Abraham Lincoln, that's his quote, a parent should walk in the way himself if he's going to teach his children to walk in the way. He better be doing it too. And so uh, <clears throat> then the, the third one, and I tell you what, I didn't put a lot of alliteration with this this week, but I just didn't have time to do all that. Jacob's restoration, verses 9 through 15. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padan Aram, that's where Laban was, and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel, prince with God, is what that means. So he called his name Israel, and, and also God said to him, I am. There's that great uh, Hebrew word, I, Yahweh. Yeah, we get our word Yahweh from there. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. We're going to get into that next week. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. Um, let's tell the politicians in, the, in America. Where, where is that place? Washington. There it is. Um, uh, uh, hey, that land over there, all that land, that, there's not a Palestinian state. That belongs to God's people. Amen? Amen? Or oh me, all right? Well, it's still true, but no, if you say amen or not, so, but, but, but the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I'm giving it to you, Jacob, and to your descendants, everybody down through the line after you, I give this land. And it's not just the land that they're, they have today, it's all that area through there, Jordan and on, I don't have time to give you the boundaries. But then God went up <clears throat> from him in the place where he was talking with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had talked with him. Remember, he did that before at Bethel, a pillar of stone. And he poured out a drink offering. Now, I, didn't, I don't have anything in this cup, but he pours it out. And he pours out this drink offering, and Jacob calls the name on this rock where God spoke to him, Bethel, God's house. And so praise the Lord. Uh, now, God gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes. Those are his 12 sons. And that's where these tribes will all come from. And so the drink offering is what's called a libation offering. We see in verse 13 and 15, I just read to you. It is the oldest type of offering in history. You can't get any older than the pouring out. I think of the Apostle Paul as he was about to die. He is just very quickly, they're going to take him on the Alpian way and cut his head off. And it's, uh, notice the symbol of pouring out his life to the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure, it's at hand. Doesn't sound like he's in a whole lot of grief there, does it? <laughs> it's <laughs> dying. What's the big deal there? You know, he, he's been looking forward to it. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. That's either the truth or it's a lie. One or the other. So uh, let's continue on here. Jesus poured himself out as a drink offering for our sins. Where's that in the Bible? Psalm 22, Psalm 53. You can look it up for yourself. Let's go on here. The death of Rachel. We've done Deborah's death, and that broke Jacob's heart to the point 
He even names this place the place of weeping and grief. But now we see the death of Rachel. No, why not? Why not Leah? Well, he didn't want Leah. How about Bilhad and, and Zippoth? Uh, no, those are the handmaidens or concubines he had children with. He wanted Rachel. He worked 14 years for this lady. He loved her. And now she, she dies. We're going to go to Bethlehem. I'm going to end today with the, talking to you about Bethlehem and about this sweet lady here. But let's take a look at it because this is the text. I'm just trying to walk through it. Verse 16. And they journeyed from Bethel. And when they were, it was a little distance to go to Ephrath, which is right outside, uh, just like a mile or two north of Bethlehem. Today it's, it's encased. Rachel's labor labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, uh, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, she's dying, that she called his name Ben Oni, Ben Oni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father renamed him Ben Jamin, uh, which means son of my right hand. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. We didn't get to go there this last year uh, when we were in Israel, but um, usually I take groups there. It's out, in the, like I said, it's just north. We went to the, <clears throat> uh, the Herodian, but uh, we didn't get to go. It's on the other side of Bethlehem. Rachel dies from this hard labor. She's there dying. Rachel names it, the, the, this little boy is the son of my grief. I'm grieving. I'm going to die. And she knew it. You know, Jacob says, no, I'm going to rename him the son of my right hand. But, um, you know, this is um, Ephrathah. Uh, Micah 5.2, where will the Messiah be born? Bethlehem of Ephrathah, the Bible says. It's very special because of the person who died there. And uh, yes, she made some mistakes. She blew it. Hey, <laughs> don't look at me. I've, if I point a finger at you, I've got three pointing back at me. I tell you what, I blow it. You blow it. We all do. It's okay. God's the God of a second chance. If we start another church someday, I'd like to name it the God, the church of a second chance, and a third and fourth and fifth and sixth, and we can continue on. So. But, but you, you, you don't have to have a death for grief to come, though. So Reuben also does something really grievous here. Reuben, the oldest son, who is going to receive the... Um, the, the uh, preeminence. Um, he lays with Bilhah, one of the concubines that, he, that Jacob had had children with. And so we see this in verse 21 and 22. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent before the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard about it. He's grieved. Because he knows he's going to have to remove him probably from the lineage of uh, the Messiah. He, the, the, the Messiah is not going to be born in that lineage. He was the firstborn. So you say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, thanks for asking. Genesis chapter 49, verses 2 and 9. And I don't think I went over it last week, but we also see Simeon and Levi. God never forgets. He judges all of them at the same time. This is many years later. This is while they're in Egypt with Joseph. We're right at the end of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 49, verse 2. Gather together and hear your sons of Jacob and listen to Israel, your father. Jacob is dying. 
He's just hours away. And he says to Reuben, verse 3, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength. He really loved Reuben. The excellence of dignity and the excellence of power. Listen to those things. But you are as unstable as water. You shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it and went up to my couch and had this relations with Bilhad. I don't have time to go into all of that means. There's other things that could um, be connected to that. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Verse 5, that goes back last week to verse chapter 34. Instruments of cruelty. They killed all the men at Shechem. And in their dwelling place, let not your soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger, they slew a man. And in the, the self-will, they hamstrung an ox. They, they used circumcision. And while the men of that city were completely incapacitated, they slew them. He says, curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So you see, God, payday is someday, and they just will face that. Verse 8, Judah, who's going to get all the, who's going to get all, all the stuff now? If Reuben, Levi, Simeon, number four on the list, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. The name Judah means to praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Your father's kids, their tribes will bow down to Judah. Judah is a lion, a whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. He's talking about the Messiah. And really, if you go back and look at the Masoretic text, along with the Hebrew, the, uh, it makes it fairly clear. Uh, there's some, you know, people argue over that, but to me, it's, fairly, it's talking about the Lord. So it grieved Israel to remove his sons from the blessing but he had no choice. That's what God told him to do. They lost their inheritance, and I assume the Messiah would be born through their lineage, but God said, no, it's going to come through the line of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of praise. What was the first tribe that went into Israel? Anybody remember? This kind of hits my brain. I don't know why I bring it up, but who was the first one to go into the promised land? First tribe, Judah. Why? Because you go before the Lord with praise. And that's what that name means. Amen. So Simeon and Levi, had, they lost their rights. Judah is the next. So next, after you go down through it, he's next. Jesus is from the line of the tribe of Judah. So praise God for that. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so as we think of grief, also, we see the death of Isaac, verse 27 through 29. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, at uh, Gerjoth Arba, that's Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years old. Wow. So Isaac breathed his last and he died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And notice these two boys, Esau and Jacob, these twins bury him at the cave of Machpelah. And so praise God, 180 years old, we see a close. Grief. It's all over the Bible. But my friend, grief, God can use grief to keep, let us know this is not heaven. It's earth. Bad stuff happens here. Have you noticed that? Have you picked up on that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Why do we have darkness? 
I mean, what, what's this whole thing about dark showing up? Every, it seems like it comes every day. Have you noticed that? It gets dark in the afternoon, just about the time you get really rolling good. Oh, it's dark. Why do we have grief and darkness and pain and suffering? Why? Why don't we just start off in heaven? And then come to earth. Wouldn't it be a lot easier? I guarantee you, God's doing it just right. We start here, and we decide what we will do with Christ. Will we receive him or not? And let him be the balm of Gilead to our grief. Because going through this night... When we see him face to face, and there is no night in heaven, heaven is God's answer to grief. Amen. It makes you appreciate it a whole lot more. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A couple years ago, maybe less than that, I was in the mercy. We unhooked the uh, uh, life support to Margaret. I love Margaret. She cooked for us. She was over when we started this church in the uh, Walmart building. She came and joined. And great cook, nurse, uh, everything, Margaret Brown. She was in intensive care for about 26 days, if I remember right. And I was there when we unhooked the uh, I, I got there early so I could spend some time just with her Even she's unconscious, she's on a ventilator and all that business and it's during this COVID mess thing you know, so I'm in there and praying with her reading scripture to her, etc because I don't know I, I, it's what the Lord impressed me to do and so pretty soon her family came from Wichita Falls and I got them back there and we were going over and so uh, uh, I was letting them say what they wanted to or whatever and I kept watching her. Uh, they turned off the machine, the doctor had already done that so it took a while for her body to, to wind down so I could see her heartbeat on her carotid artery there. I was setting off to the side letting the family have their grief time. I'd already visited with them, prayed with them. And, um, and so uh, I could see that heart slowing, slowing, slowing. So I got up and gathered them around. And we, I said, let's just sing her into glory. Let's just sing her right into glory. So we began to sing some great old hymns together, ones that everyone would know, Amazing Grace, etc., and so, as we did, I, uh, as we got, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise. And I noticed her heart stopped than when we first begun. I said, she was with us. She was and she wasn't, for God has taken her. And so, yes, there was a lot of weeping and the grief, I understand, because she's loved. I'm standing over there, and she has a large son. I mean, this guy is, you wouldn't want to mess with him, but uh, he is a big guy, and I know she had prayed for him to be saved. I'm sitting over there just kind of waiting and just to see if I could be of any help to them. We've already sung. She's already, they've already, you know, everything. They're just waiting for the family to leave so they could get the body taken care of and all that. And that big young man turned around to me. He said, preacher, can you tell me how to be saved? I jumped up. I said, you better believe I can. Come on over here, son. And he gave his heart to Jesus Christ 
right there in the room with his dead mama. Amen. That's a good way to grieve. Give your heart to Jesus. Follow after him. Because you see, that's what happened in Bethlehem. When you are grieving, go to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a place of heartache. We just went through it here in chapter 35. It's where Rachel died. Yes, it hurts. But that's where Jesus was born. That's where those little babies were all killed there. It's a place of death. It hurts. But it's also a house of bread, Bethlehem. And then it's also a place of hunger. We see Ruth right there out gleaning in. And yet she finds the wonderful Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, a type of Jesus. You'll find him in grief. Amen. Then you can go there. <laughs> no, that's where Ruth found Boaz, and oh, it's a place of happiness that turns from grief to happiness because there was a wedding with them together. It's also a place of heroism. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, David is running from Saul, and he's so, he's in a cave, and he says, oh boy, if I could just have a, a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. And some of his men love him so much, they they risk their lives to get in there to get that water. And they bring it out. And David is so overwhelmed by that. They bring him water from the well. He takes it and pours it out as a drink offering to give God thanks for such men and, and such heroism that we see at Bethlehem. Bethlehem is also a place of hope because that's where the Prince of Hope himself was born in the Bethlehem barn. Only Jesus brings eternal hope. That is our hope. What a Savior. What a God. The answer, this is not in your notes. I just added it this morning. And I'm going to put it up on the screen now. Revelation chapter 21, verses um, 3 and 4. And uh, we're coming to this here, and we'll be there in a couple of weeks in our study in the book of Revelation. But notice what John the Beloved, God leads him to write. And I heard a loud voice. You know, there's lots of loud stuff in heaven. Amen? And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold! That word in the Greek literally means, I don't know exactly how to spell it, and you've heard me speak try to spell this few times you spell it this way <gasps> however you spell that that's what that word means let your breath be taken behold the tabernacle of God is with man he will dwell with them and they shall be his people God himself will be with them and be their God. And God himself will wipe away every single tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have all been passed away. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. That's the answer to grief, is heaven and a Savior who's made it possible that we can spend eternity there forever and forever. Oh, my friend, next week I'll be 71 years old. Can you believe that? If I should, if the Lord removes me and they're having a funeral here, they got my old carcass laid out here. <laughs> You come by and cry. I'll ask God to let me come back and jump up and slap you one, all right? Because that's what I've been looking for my whole life, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. What a Savior. Oh, yes, grief is hard. It's bloody. It's red. And I've given you that entire paper today. Take that home and go through it. I don't have time to do that. But I want you to know. That's the answer. Is his answer is Jesus. And he said, Dan, I'm taking you home. 
we're going home. Amen. You've seen me do this little video before, and I hate to just do the same one over, but it, it's this verse. I can't help it. I'd ask you just to watch it and let the Lord speak to you. Whatever you're grieving about, whatever is going on, I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. Just pretend you've never seen it before. <laughs> and then we'll be done.
<laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you bow with me, please? There may be someone here today that have never said yes to Jesus Christ as your Savior. Our answer is Him and Him alone. You need Him more than you need another breath of air. Today, if you don't know Him, would you pray and receive Him as your Savior? Just say, Dear God, come and live in my heart. Forgive me of my sin and save my soul. If you would do that, believe it with your whole soul and heart, I'd like to pray with you and encourage you, give you some materials. You don't have to join anything or do anything. We just, if you'll come forward when we give us one verse of invitation, we'll all rejoice because of it. Maybe today you've gone through some deep grief. God understands. He's acquainted with our grief, the Bible says. He understands it. He's quite acquainted with it. This is not heaven, it's earth. But one day, this will all be over. And now, today, say yes to Christ. So that one day, you can live with him for eternity. What makes heaven heaven is not the mansion or anything else there. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Today, say yes to him. Father, take now this simple message. May it bring glory to you and you alone. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're standing, I'll meet you right here at the front. If you want to make a decision for Christ as we stand, would you come? If you um, want to join the church, make other decisions, we'd be happy to have you. Just come right now. While we're singing, you be coming. Thank you so very much for being here. Oh, yeah, we went to church and we learned about grief today. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. But I hope today God has encouraged you and helped you. And I hope you'll please take those materials with you. If you need more, we'll help you with that. But encourage people, you know, to take those. Usually I tease people and say, you know, for a gift of $9.99, I'll send to you absolutely free. Uh, no, there's, I'm not even going to tease. All right, it's yours. We want people, they're free. Give them away. Everything we do here, give it away for Jesus. Amen. And uh, thank you uh, so very much. Also, Revelation chapter 19, we'll start verse 11. I think we'll finish the whole chapter. I'm not 100% sure, but we will um, be doing that Wednesday night. We are, again, grateful for all of our guests today. God bless you all. Uh, and uh, uh, so, Brother Bryant, as usual, you'd always bless us and lead us in our closing, please. <laughs>